All right, good morning, everybody. We got a little bit of a late start because of a, a bit of technical difficulties with our new wonderful TV screen that we have here in our new Ben's place, but it is working, and so now we're able to start. Um, for those of you who don't know me, and I think I introduced myself to everybody as they were walking in or last night, I'm Michael Scharf, and together with Jessica Berg, we are the co-deans of the law school. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the annual Barristers Golden Circle Brunch to celebrate the achievements of those who graduated 50 years ago. And uh, Jessica Berg will come up in a little bit um, and she'll be helping me read the bios of the people that we're honoring. As we are, were unable to gather last year due to the COVID-19 pandemic, today we're going to be celebrating two classes, 1970 and 1971, as the newest members of our circle. It is so wonderful to be able to gather again in person and to do so in our newly remodeled law school and student space, Ben Space. Um, we also have some alums from older classes, including, I guess, our oldest alum, my good friend, Jack Terry, um, class of 55. Thanks for making it out here from, from Arizona. Let's start the program by going back in time 50 years to the 1970s, 1970 and 1971. The 70s may have been a lot of things, but boring was not one of them. Let's see, the king of rock and roll, Elvis Presley, visited President Nixon at the White House Oval Office. And despite water, the beginnings of the Watergate scandal, Nixon that year was Time's Person of the Year. The Apollo 13 spacecraft, which was intended to be the third landing on the moon, it had an oxygen tank explosion during the flight. It was severely damaged. People watched anxiously as NASA and the astronauts improvised a way to return the crew safely to Earth. Four students were killed and nine others were wounded on May 4th, 1970, when members of the Ohio National Guard opened fire on students protesting the Vietnam War at Kent State University, just 30 minutes down the street. Walt Disney World opened in Orlando, Florida, and the first Starbucks opened in Seattle. And I'm sure a lot of us wish that we had the farsight to have invested back then. The NASDAQ index made its debut on Wall Street that year. Gas costs on average was 36 cents a gallon, and the average cost of a home was $25,000. In 1970, Simon and Garfunkel's Bridge Over Troubled Water topped the charts. In 1971, it was Three Dog Nights, Joy to the World, and the Beatles released their final album, Let It Be, before breaking up. I don't know if you guys know this, but we have a faculty student rock band that plays across the way at the what used to be the Barking Spider. I don't know if it even existed, probably not, um, way back in your time. But it's now Cosmic Dave's Rock Club. And we've also played for the Jam for Justice, which is to benefit the Legal Aid Society. And we always play Let It Be. That's, that's one of our crowd pleasers. The top grossing movies of 1970 were Love Story, Airport, and M.A.S.H. In 1971, they were A Clockwork Orange, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, and The French Connection. All in the Family was the most popular TV show. And Professor Lou Katz was in his second year of teaching at the law school. Out of those times rose some amazing law graduates. There are 11 members of the classes of 1970 and 1971 attending today. Dean Berg is going to tell you about their achievements in a few minutes. Their participation represents the dedication and commitment that their class has shown to the law school over the years. I want to start out by recognizing the Class of 1970 Reunion Advisory Committee. That's Howard Friedman, who couldn't be with us today, Carrie Dustin, who I see in the front row, and the Honorable Ray Volker and Michael Drain. Not only 
Have they been active in encouraging participation for reunion events? But they and their classmates have been amazingly generous in fundraising to provide transformational support for the School of Law. In addition, I'd like to give a special thanks to the following members of the class who have made extraordinary personal commitments to the success of our law school. Three years ago, the late Coley Burke gave an astounding $10 million to establish the Coleman Burke Center for Environmental Law before he passed away. Howard Friedman has committed a significant gift from his estate, and we also have an anonymous member from the class of 1970 who has committed close to $590,000 and who is still currently matching all class of 1970 gifts up to $10,000 each. We are so grateful for your confidence in Case Western Reserve University School of Law. We thank you so much. I would also like to recognize our Reunion Advisory Committee from the class of 1971. The Honorable Herb Phipps, Jerry Boykin, Joyce Needitz, Snow, and Marie Grossman. Thank you all. The Barrister's Circle is a distinguished group. 21 of the 28 Centennial Medal winners, including Herb Phipps, those are the people who won the highest honor given by the Law School Alumni Association. Those are members of the circle, and we are honored that our most recent Centennial Medal Award winner, Herb Phipps, is with us this morning and gave what I thought was just an amazing speech last night. And I was glad to see that everybody um, gave him a, an astounding standing ovation at the end of it. Before we honor the classes of 1970 and 1971 who are with us today, there is much to celebrate about the law school in 2021. So I'm going to give you a quick update. If you were here last night, there's some repetition, and I apologize for that, but some of you weren't, and we do have much to celebrate that we want to share. In response to the pandemic, we pivoted nearly overnight in March 2020 to remote learning. This fall, we were able to welcome students back to campus at full capacity. During that time, we launched a spring start and a summer jumpstart program for our incoming JDs to offer more flexibility and support. In the fall of 2021, we started a new master's degree and certificate program in healthcare compliance and risk management. Last spring, our moot court and mock trial teams had a historic run of successes, though it was a co all competitions done remotely. Seven of those teams reached the finals or won top speaker awards. CWRU has been recognized as a top law school in a variety of national rankings this year, including U.S. News and World Report, which ranked us 11th best in health law and 16th best in international law. Pre-Law Magazine, which ranked us number six in the country in practical training. And number 11, or and we also had 11 of our 11 of our specialty programs were ranked among the top with A rankings by Pre-Law Magazine. And I, I will just pause to tell you, when you walked in here, you probably saw a flag that said that we were a national leader in experiential education. That's really what we are. And to be recognized with a number six ranking in that area is really gratifying to all of us. The number of our students attaining judicial clerkships from the class of 2021 doubled compared to the many previous years. And that was really great. That's a, a sign of the health of the school and its recognition by judges. Our, incom our incoming first year class this year had 160 JD students. And of those, the median LSAT was a 160. The median GPA was a 3.61. And those are some of the best numbers that we've ever had. We were rated as a top law school for producing the most super lawyers, an honor that goes to the top 5% of all lawyers by Thomson Reuter. And I know many of the people in this room have had that honor. And you have probably noticed not just 
the Ben's place, but the other renovations and the beautiful park that has been installed next to our law school. All of this has really been transformational and given us a really warm feeling and high morale for our faculty, our students, our staff, and we're so glad to be able to share that now with our alums. Um, this room and the rotunda is thanks to Roe Green, who you might have um, met last night, and she's been a huge supporter of us as well. Now, we're going to move on to the formal induction of the newest members of the Golden Circle in just a second. But before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the members of the class of 1970 and of 1971, and all the members of the circle who have passed away. Their names are listed on the posters in the back of the room and on the, so on the slide right here. And I think we should take a brief moment of silence to remember them. Thank you. So Dean Berg and I are now going to welcome representatives from the classes to share some remarks and some memorable moments from their law school days. And then we're going to introduce each of our inductees. When your name is called, please come to the podium. We're going to present you with your barrister certificate. They're here, they're very charming, suitable for um, putting up in your office or home. And we're gonna take a photo with you. So, let me begin by introducing Carrie Dustin from the class of 1970 to come up and say a few words. Carrie? Do you have, okay, let's see. You, do you have a script? No. Nope. Okay. Uh, then we're I'm totally <laughs> unscripted and uh, hope, hope that you enjoy it. I think the thing that pretty much is most memorable to me is that first semester when we're all wandering around. And I was the old class in the old law school. I think class of 71 was there, too. And it's that first couple of weeks when everybody's walking around and we're all being taught Socratic method. and. A lot of dazed faces. Do you understand what's going on? Do you understand what's going on? And then every so often you run into somebody that had a gleam in their eye and they got it. And then pretty soon you either got it or you weren't in the class anymore because that's just the way it was. That you figured out that it was a new way of learning and you were going to have to think and you were going to have to stand on your feet and you're going to have to defend what you thought. and you're going to have to make your way in the world. And so that's kind of the most memorable part of what I had. The second most memorable part is really a good thing, and it's a tough thing that I want to share with you. That is a major concern for me. So when I graduated, I was really, really proud, and I was really happy to be admitted to the uh, practice of law after I passed the bar exam. But I never practiced. And it gave me a rather unique viewpoint and I've done some expert witness work. And so I've been in lots of courts. I've seen lots of good judges, lots of bad judges. I've seen lots of good lawyers, lots of bad lawyers. And every day I see lots of practice of the law. And over time, I've come to find that I don't think we're doing a very good job of policing our own profession. I think probably many of you are investors. And I ask you how many times a month you get one of those solicitations for settlement of a um, securities matter that has one of those little suits in it that's basically a nuisance suit that's been settled that goes absolutely nowhere and that is absolutely legal blackmail in my opinion. And I ask you why are we tolerating this leeching of the law. And then you see a lot of other lawsuits that if you're on boards or whatever, that are just meritless lawsuits that aren't being dismissed by, you're all judges, they're, or not all judges, some of you are judges, that aren't being dismissed at the right time, um, or are allowed to progress to 
legal blackmail. And so I, I just, for me, think that there needs to be a way that we need to improve the quality of our profession. There's a lot of anger out there toward our profession and a lot of concern that we should be doing more good. And I think it all goes back to two things. Number one, we need to be more adherent to the truth. And number two, I think we need to have a better care for the quality of education and freedom of speech. And those two things are vastly important to me. And I know that my gifts to the law school will be working on those two issues. Thanks. Thank you. That was terrific. No, you did not need to have written remarks at all. Jessica, can you come on up? It's time for us to uh, introduce our new inductees. Okay, actually, um, uh, Carrie Dustin is our first inductee. Oh. So Carrie founded Falls River Group over 28 years ago, specializing in mergers and acquisitions of middle market companies. He has over 50 years of transaction experience, which encompasses buying and selling businesses, structuring financial practices for acquisitions and valuations of closely held businesses in the United States, Europe, and South America. Carrie is also vice chairman of the Board of Commissioners for the Naples Airport Authority and a member of the Association for Corporate Growth and the National Association of Corporate Directors. Recent travels include Domaine Serene Winery in Dayton, Oregon, where Carrie enjoyed lots of Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, and a visit to the Evergreen Aviation and Space Museum in McMinnville, Oregon. Congratulations, Carrie. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I take this with me. You get to keep get it. To take it with you. Are we switching off or do you want to just take them? I'll just go through them and then I think we're going to, we need to pause the tune to get the one photo. And then you've got the back and forth. Our next inductee is the Honorable John Hoffman. Judge John R. Hoffman was elected to the bench of the Stark County Court of Common Pleas Domestic Relations Division in 1993. He was the administrative judge of the Domestic Relations and Juvenile Divisions and was the presiding judge of the Court of Common Pleas in 1996. Judge Hoffman was a partner in the law firm of Hoffman and Hoffman for over 25 years. He previously served as the assistant city prosecutor and assistant city solicitor for the city of Canton, special counsel for the Ohio Attorney General, and chairman of the Jackson Township Board of Trustees. Judge Hoffman also served as trustee and vice president for the Ohio Association of Domestic Relations Judges and served two years on the Ohio General Assembly Task Force for Family and Children. He is a decorated veteran of the Vietnam War, having served as a captain in the U.S. Army. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our last inductee from the class of 1970 is the Honorable Ray Volker. Ray started his career as a special agent at the Federal Reserve Bank in Cleveland. In Cleveland. He then worked as an associate and partner, partner at Upson, Secor, Cassidy, and McPartland from 1973 to 1993. He served as Cheshire, Connecticut probate district judge for 28 years, as well as administrative judge as the, of the Waterbury, Connecticut Regional Children's Court in the late 2000s. Following that, he served as the statewide probate magistrate for the complex matters from 2011 to 2015. Ray is currently counsel with Secor Cassidy McPartland. He is highly active in his community and has served on many professional and volunteer boards and associations. A member of the Maddock Drum Band of Waterbury, Connecticut, which formed in 1767 as the Walcott Connecticut Militia, and a member of the past senior and a past senior warden of St. Peter's Episcopal, Episcopal Church. He's participated in men's basketball and is currently a senior in a senior softball league. He was a youth sports coach for football, baseball, softball, and swimming when his children were growing up. 
and he is married to Lynn Jewett um, from since 1968. Congratulations. <laughs> Everyone, please join me in welcoming the class of 1970 to the Barrister's Golden Circle. Are you 1970? Oh, do I, don't, I don't know why I don't have you on here. Hang on a second. Did you take him off? Is he here? He's right there. I got you. Sorry about that. I had it deleted from our script. I think they didn't realize. I apologize. We have an additional inductee from 1970, and I want to make sure that we recognize him. So Fred Narragon, also class of 1970. Fred is a lifelong resident of Salem, Ohio. He received a degree in chemical engineering from Grove City College and a degree in law from Case Western Reserve University. Fred practiced with, the, with Filch and Kendall Law Firm in Salem, Ohio for five years before opening a private practice in 1975. He worked for and then led the Public Defender's Office in Columbiana County for 23 years before establishing and running the Criminal Defense Company, which provided for public defense in the county for the 19 years after the Public Defender's Office closed. In addition, he taught business law at Kent State University for more than 20 years. Fred remains highly engaged in Salem, serving in a variety of community boards and projects. He's devoted a number of years to the renovation and preservation of the childhood home of the artist Charles E. Birchfield, and participated in many Salem Jubilee Festival events over the years, including balloon rides, parades, putt-putt, selling lemonade and shrimp, together I hope not, donating all, donating all the proceeds that he gained to charity. He has also placed in the best liar competition. <laughs> I'd tell you to ask him about it, but I don't know if he'll tell you the truth. <laughs> Thank you so much and welcome. Congratulations. Um, I apologize again with that. That is our class of 1970, and we are moving on to the induction of the class of 1971. You can. Now, before we celebrate the accomplishments of the class of 1971, I'd like to ask Jerry Boykin from the class of 1971 to come up and say a few words. What I thought I'd like to do is to talk a little bit about my personal journey in ending up here at Case Western Reserve and um, how much the school means to me and I think the other peoples in our class um, before getting on to uh, some of the notable members like Judge Phipps who have uh, really stood out uh, in the class. Um, I took the LSAT in Saigon during the Tet Offensive in 1968. Um, I had to get two, I had an average of three hours sleep for 10 days. I had to get two kids to, uh, in flak vests and rifles, loaded rifles to run the road into the uh, Vietnamese American Center in uh, Saigon. Um, there was blood on the walls of the building, the outdoors of the building. Um, during the session, they had a, a Viet Cong battalion to hold up in a cemetery two blocks away. And the flight path for the bombers was right over top of the building that we're in. So every two minutes it shook like this going forward. Um, needless to say, I didn't do a, 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 a real optimum job on, the, on that exam. As, as Lou, Katz, Lou Katz told me very seriously, he says, you know, you've got the best excuse in the history of this exam for not doing that well. <laughs> and that was true. Um, when I got back, though, from Vietnam, and I, I decided I did want to go to law school, and I went and interviewed several places. I did not even know that this place had a law school when I started off. But two schools, Cornell and Virginia, that I wanted to go to, both said, look, um, if you want to go to law school, you can always transfer here if you do well uh, in your first semester or your first year. So we recommend that you go apply to that school in Cleveland because they're one of the few uh, schools in the country that are under admitted. Uh, 
So I went, I, I talked to people here, nothing much came of it. Um, I was painting houses in Ann Arbor. And my mother called me one morning and said, that law school in Cleveland wants to talk to you. This was uh, the day after Labor Day. And so I called, and uh, I don't recall exactly who I talked to, but um, they asked me, they said, do you still want to go to law school? I said, yeah, OK. They said, all right, you're in. I said, all right, great. What do I have to do? Be here at noon tomorrow. I said, wait, I don't have any money. They said, don't worry about it. We'll take care of everything. And they did. You know, I started off, I'm, I'm staying at the, the Tudor Arms Hotel. That was a graduate house in, in uh, those days where the, uh, the graduate students stayed. And uh, I stayed there for a year um, when I first uh, started off with this. But um, they took care of me when I, when I came in here. And that wasn't the first time that they took care of me throughout my career. Every time I turned around, somebody here was helping me, was pushing me in the right direction, was giving me the benefit of something. And it's, uh, you know, at the end of my first year, I, were, I was third in a class or somewhere like that. I had uh, the ability, I think, to transfer just about anywhere I wanted to go. But I decided that I owed them uh, the, uh, you know, the ability to stay here rather than to go someplace else, because they had done a lot for me, and I thought that um, I owed them in return. And I've never regretted that decision 50 years later. Um, you know, I practiced law as a, a trial lawyer in Virginia, Northern Virginia. Um, I was with the Federal Trade Commission for a while. All those things, uh, you know, I, I was able, with the education I got, I was able to compete with anybody in the country. And I did a lot of plaintiffs' antitrust work when I started off, and all lawyers on the other side were Harvard, UVA, Yale lawyers, and I could hold my own with them because of the, uh, the background that I got here. Uh, my class, if you look over there, um, I, I want to candidly say we probably had the worst class in the history of this school. <laughs> we had a very small class. Uh, we had a bunch of people that uh, didn't have anything to do, apparently, at, at the time. Um, and the, the fact that uh, um, some of us are still here and, and surviving, that's a, that's a pretty good uh, testimony. If you look at our class picture, you see that as opposed to 1970, we had a number of, of black lawyers. In, in our class. Uh, we also had a number of women. I think it was probably a record at the time. If you look on there, there are 10 women that uh, graduated in my class. But all of them are on the same line in the photo. <laughs> and don't you think that they uh, commented about that when they saw it? Um, and it was really difficult for women to, uh, uh, to compete and to, and to be treated fairly. Um, Art Austin was a uh, contracts teacher. We, our class had a, a, a 9 a.m. Saturday morning class. He got up the first day and looked around the class and he said, Saturday from now on is ladies' day. And he would only call on the women on uh, Saturday morning to, uh, to comment and so forth. The rest of them were saying, this is great, you know. Well, the, the women got together and went to the dean and uh, ladies' day stopped shortly thereafter. <laughs> so. Um, we do have some remarkable uh, achievers. I think you know Rick Patterson is a is a, a famous author um, who's uh, sold a, a number of books. He's well known all over the world. Uh, Jerry Weiss is one of the top mediators in uh, the country and uh, has made a name for himself. Uh, Judge Phipps, who we talked about before, uh, has has done a remarkable job. Um, he was a mentor, or his mentor was C.B. King, and uh, King used to come here and visit him from time to time, make sure he was doing all right and, and headed in the right direction. Uh, he was, except he hung around with me and Weiss and a couple other guys on, on occasion, and uh, that sometimes got him off in the wrong direction. And Kathy Haverman, you've always been special in your own way all the, going through this. So. Um, it, this school has meant a lot to me over the years. It's meant a lot to, uh, uh, I think, other people here. Um, you know, and, and Herb, we were talking. I had a, one of the earlier deans came to me in time and said, you know, that this school, um, other than Howard in uh, Washington, D.C., graduated more black lawyers than any uh, school in the country up until the Civil Rights Act. And um, 
uh, Fred Gray, you know, well, Martin Luther King's lawyer was a, was a, a graduate here, and um, it's a you know it's a special place. They've done a lot. The very first class had a black lawyer in it in 1896. We were the last class to graduate from the old building, um, which we the decor of which we used to refer to as 1896 bus station, you know, down the street here, which was a. You know, we always, so we always felt a little second class. They had this brand new, beautiful facility and so forth. But it was a great, uh, a great experience for me. Um, I'm still able to sit up and take nourishment. So we'll see how long that lasts, and uh, we'll go from there. But I want to, I want to thank the school, and I want to thank uh, my classmates who are dear friends of mine. Um, Fifty years later, that uh, all you've done for me, and uh, how meaningful this uh, this school has been to all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. And when you were mentioning uh, the situation with female lawyers and law students, wow, how much things have changed. We have a female dean for the last eight years, and we have 59% of our entering JD students were female this year. Um, One other thing I forgot sure. to mention, I would just like to add here about women. Marie Grossman was nine months pregnant and she took her exams in the, in the spring of uh, 1972. The professors were terrified, you know, that she was going to give birth <laughs> on the spot. And, you know, we sit in exams and they sit her up front in a special place and watch it. She would, you know, waddle up with her exam at the end of the thing. And at the end of it, you know, and she took her last exam and uh, delivered the baby out either that day or the very next day. And she finished first in the class. It, it was an extraordinary class. So it is uh, time now to recognize each of our new inductees, and it's fitting that our first inductee is Jerry Boykin. Let me tell you a little bit about this gentleman. After graduating from law school, Jerry went to work for the FTC in Washington, D.C., then went into private practice in Northern Virginia with an emphasis on complex civil litigation. In his long career, Jerry litigated cases all over the country, having first chaired antitrust, environmental, RICO, and business torts cases, among others. He still works full-time, but is thinking it may be time to step back and retire. Jerry was elected to the Virginia Trial Lawyers Hall of Fame around 2010 and has enjoyed a long and successful career. He has two grown sons and is still waiting for grandchildren. Jerry says that law school was a great launching pad for his practice, and the education he received allowed him to compete and thrive. And we heard it all from him in a really wonderful speech this morning. Thank you. Do you have the little... Thank you. Next up is Gerald Jackson. After graduation, Gerald was an assistant director for the Lawyers for Housing joint project with the American Bar Association and the Cleveland Bar Association. He began working at Alexander, Jackson, and Buchanan in 1973, where he was senior partner. In 1992, Gerald founded the Jackson Law Company. Gerald is a founding member of the law school's Black Law Student Association and the Norman S. Minor Bar Association. He served on the board of trustees for the East Urban YMCA, as well as the Emeritus House, Phyllis Wheatley Association. He served for many years on the CWRU Law Alumni Board and is a member of the Society of Ventures. Congratulations. Our next inductee is Kathy Haveman. 
Kathy Millman Haviman moved to Dayton with her husband, Bill Haviman, also Law 1970, after her last law final. It was 1971, but she was utterly shocked to find she was unable to find any law-related employment in Dayton. Not a single female was allowed in a law firm, and a common pleas judge boldly and at the time legally announced he would never hire a woman. Kathy eventually had a career with the first court of appeals until she was asked to leave before the birth of her second child as pregnancy, quote, appeared unseemly. Thirteen years of what she calls an interim retirement followed as she raised four children, volunteered in schools, drove incessantly everywhere, and helped Bill with depositions. Kathy returned to work for the digital legal publisher LexisNexis. It was her answer to every law student's dream. No more dusty library stacks, missing books, missing pages, unpublished decisions. She spent 25 years in the best job she could have imagined, half as a senior legal analyst and half in creating algorithms for legal, business, and people indexing and taxonomies. She retired for real this time in 2013. And yet, she says she currently has less time to herself than when she worked full time. She loves hiking any woodsy trail she can find in Ohio, southern Indiana, and even parts of the Appalachian Trail, taking her 69th year of ballet classes, volunteering wherever needed, and having more fun than she ever thought possible. She has four children in their 40s and 10 grandchildren, ranging from the ages of 1 to 23, the oldest soon to graduate from CWRU. Bill Haviman died in 2008 at age 63. Congratulations. Do you want to do this one? Sure. Our next inductee is the Honorable Herbert Phipps. Judge Phipps earned a BA degree from Morehouse College and a Master's of Laws from University of Virginia School of Law. After law school, Judge Phipps returned to Albany, Georgia to join the law practice of C.B. King. The firm emphasized civil rights litigation, including school desegregation, students' rights, rights police brutality, jury discrimination, and discriminatory employment practices. From 1983 to 1995, Judge Phipps engaged in the solo practice of law. Judge Phipps has served as a magistrate and associate judge, a judge of the Dougherty County Juvenile Court on the Dougherty Circuit Superior Court and was appointed to the Court of Appeals of Georgia. He became the presiding judge of the court and he served as chief judge of the Court of Appeals before retiring from the court in 2016. In 2018, Governor Nathan Deal appointed Judge Phipps senior appellate judge for the Court of Appeals, which means he's back presiding over cases once again. Herb was an active member of our Black Law Students Association and is a longtime supporter of the law school. This weekend, he was also awarded the Centennial Medal, the highest honor awarded by our Law Alumni Association. And I hope everybody was there last night because it was truly an inspiring speech. Congratulations, Herb. Thank you. Our final inductee today is Jerry Weiss. Jerry is the founder of Mediation Incorporated. As the first lawyer in Cleveland to devote his practice entirely to alternative dispute resolution, he has mediated a broad range of complex disputes that often involve significant emotional components. He teaches and speaks on topics dealing with conflict and people and institutions in conflict around the US and abroad including as an adjunct faculty member here at the law school, where he co-teaches the seminar in mediation representation. He is a distinguished fellow in the International Academy of Mediators, the preeminent cohort of mediators worldwide, where he is a governor. 
He's consistently recognized by leading publications, including Best Lawyers, Super Lawyers, Top 100 in Ohio, U.S. News First Tier, and London-based Who's Who Legal Mediation, in which he is the only Ohio mediator listed. Jerry is best known as a mediator who looks for and finds the human elements behind the conflict and the numbers. Please join me in congratulating Jerry on this award. Once again, please give a round of applause for our inductees of the class of um, 1970 and 1971. Thank you once again for all of you who joined us here today. Please continue to enjoy the food and the drink in each other's company for the remainder of the hour. For those of you who are attending CLE sessions with Professor Andrew Geronimo, Truth, Lies, and Malice, First Amendment Limits on State Defamation Law. It will begin at 12 p.m. in the Moot Courtroom, which is directly below us. Meanwhile, Michael and I are going to run across the street to join a celebration of the 50th year of our Black Law Students Association chapter. Enjoy the rest of your day.